Hey, it's Jeremy, Jeremy.net. I am a comic book artist, writer, reader, self-publisher, and I share my creative process here with you online. If you enjoy this channel and like to get additional bonus live streams twice a month, you become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $2 a month. You get two additional bonus episodes that are extra long, two and a half, three hour long sessions. You get access to our Patreon exclusive Discord server where we share art talk, tips, feedback, share works in progress and more. And you get access to an online digital archive where you can read my comics. If you would like to get a free digital sketchbook, work in progress in animated GIFs delivered right to your inbox and blog posts about what I'm reading, what I'm watching, what's inspiring me, you can sign up for my free monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. That's G-E-R-I-M-I. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comic books, or if you read digitally on Kindle, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. That will forward you to my Amazon author page. You can pick up books like my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. It is a standalone psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. You can also pick up books like my most recent project, Morningstar. It's uh, Lucifer's Fall from Heaven, told as a Western. It's an eight-issue series, volume one contains issues one through four. Volume two contains issues five through eight. Both volumes have extensive back matter, character sketches, thumbnails, script excerpts, photo reference, and more. I basically show you how I put all the books together. And if you go to the homepage of my YouTube channel, there are book flip-throughs of all those books. You can check them out. All right, let's get into it. I see Paul is in the chat already. He just woke up and he is rearing to go. As for me, I am working on, uh, I'm continuing the storyboard project that I was uh, was thumbnailing out. Let's see here. <laughs> Paul says the things we get excited about. Well, you know what? I think that there is something creativity in general tends to be a solitary project unless you're a musician or a filmmaker, in which case you're surrounded by people. But I think for comics, for a lot of the visual arts, it's a very solitary affair. And a lot of times it's solitary because having people around while we're trying to focus can actually be really irritating. But having people that are all, what I get from it is all people who are working on their own individual projects, but we're all together for a brief period of time, we're all focused on whatever our internal struggles are. We can kind of share, you know, the ups, the downs, the things we're struggling with, the highs, the lows, celebrate each other's successes. So it's one of those things where we can kind of be alone, but alone together. And that gets me really excited. So But for whatever reason, I'm glad you're here. Okay, so one of the things, um, I actually watched a, a bunch of YouTube videos from uh, the storyboard artist and, and animator. Um, um, I think his name is Toniko Patoa. And uh, he had a lot of really great tips for putting together a storyboard. One of the things he mentioned was also including story beats. So I broke this whole story down into eight images and then I've got a few extra that are just me trying to look at, well, what does this image do if I look like if I do it as a, a wide shot versus a uh, versus a close-up? <laughs> and Paul says, um, says, yes, let's get lonely. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So all these are just me basically trying to break down what the entire story is in and these will probably refine into nicer images, but just at a thumbnail level, it's me trying to break down the story, which is a person in space doing some repairs. You see over their shoulder that inside of the space station is a dog. You see that they're running low on oxygen. You see that they are trying to get back into the spaceship and they're locked out. You see that they are miming towards a control lever to the dog, and because it's a thumbnail, I didn't bother getting in there and getting detailed, but it's gonna say manual override above the lever, you know, just indicating to the dog that they need to do something. The dog pulls the lever, she's back in the space station. So, 
And then there's just a couple of different angles of show the dog pull the lever. There's me throwing in a shot of the, the door opening. Because I feel like showing something of the, uh, the, the success of the dog opening the lever. But still her still having the panic like she's just barely getting in. And then the idea of her and the dog back together but doing it as a wider shot. Also a wider shot of her gesturing towards the lever. So th those are just ones where I realized that a lot of the shots I had are uh, either close-ups or medium shots. I didn't really – the only shot that was a wide shot was the exterior of the space station. So I wanted to look at the how it would look to, uh, to put in a couple of other shots. That said, then I'm looking that – I'm aiming to make this 100 frames in terms of a sequence – so using these story beats helps me frame how long it should take to get through each part. So if I'm doing about, you know, the halfway point would be the first four frames. So it'd be like the first one through 50, which means I can knock down to say the, uh, if you were to cut that in half, frames one through 25 should be images one and two. So if I've got 25 panels on one page, you don't really, like at the beginning of the third page or around panel 26 should be where we realize she's running out of oxygen. And that just is useful for me breaking down the pacing of this. Because actually I can go back and let's see here. This was the most recent one that I did, <clears throat> and I actually felt like it took me too long because I was actually drawing it more like an animatic than I was an actual just straight-up storyboard. So I was showing this very, very tiny space station. You get closer, 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 so you can actually identify what it is. And it's slowly rotating in the frame so that as you move closer, now you're zooming in, you can actually see that there's a little pod on the side. Then you can actually see there's a person working on the pod. And then you zoom in to the actual, like to me, this was what was the start of the story is where you can actually see her, see that she's working or placing circuit boards. She gets some sparks from her laser welding. which I don't think actually laser welds would be creating sparks, but it just seemed like the easiest way to identify the act that she's doing. And then I had a whole thing where you see her open her visor so that you can, you know, get the reveal of her face. But I was thinking, you know what? That's actually too much back and forth. I need to get into it. So maybe I just have her, like you just see her looking and yawning. There was a little bit of gags that I had in here originally, like I was going to have, like the dog is behind her trying to get her attention, just because he's a dog. He just misses her, wants to say hi. And I was going to have a little bit in here that I don't think I'm going to have room for, which was that he's barking, barking, trying to get her attention, and then there's a little control button, and you can see that written in tape on it is speak, and then you just have his shadow come up over the control button. And then you just have him slam down on the button. And then all of a sudden she gets the barking in her ear and her helmet because, you know, he just wants to get her attention. So, and I think that that's really cute. I don't know if I have space for that. So. Point is, is now I have landmarks for the pacing that I want to have in this story. So if I go back to this first set of frames. Let me come in here and just take these first two.
paste. Oop, don't want that up there. <clears throat> Now, something I need to adjust. I had worked out. Because I've redesigned the space station a couple of times. And the point of me working it out was trying to... And I can't remember if I was online with you guys or whether I was just doing this at... Um, on my own, but I was actually trying to think of the space station as a stage and working out where the repairs were going to be taking place versus the uh, where the airlock is they need to go back into. But now that I have this shot that I want to use of the looking over the shoulder, I need to figure out where would they be doing repairs where you could see space behind them on one side and the dog behind them on the other. And that might not seem super important but, I mean, if this was something that was like a film production and they had to build this in 3D, I would have to figure out where, how is this set built? How is it laid out? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going back to, where is my latest version of the space station? So what I'm going to do is I'm going back to this and I'm going to need to make a new diagram and it's not necessarily redesigning it from scratch, but what it is is me figuring out where do I need to place these elements so that I can get the second shot that's in here. Let's see here. I see Sai is in the chat. It says hi. How are you? How you doing? Thanks for uh, for stopping by. I'm just working on some uh, some thumbnails for some storyboards. It's a little space story about an astronaut locked out of their space station. and solving some technical problems so I can get the shots that I want. So let's see here. What will be required I'm trying to think if I'm looking at a stage Kind of need to do this off to the side so I have room to build in any direction. But let's say that the pod with all the circuit boards that the astronaut is working on, say that's here in the center. Let's say the astronaut is right there working on the pods. Now let's say that over their shoulder, you can see another part of the space station. And 
and that is where the dog is. So maybe there's just an arm out here. And the reason why they're called what they call this staging is because it's like I'm building a stage for them to perform. So thinking about what are the actions that the uh, the astronaut's going to take, where is the dog going to be in relationship to those actions? Where's where are they going to move to throughout the scene and where are they going to be at the conclusion? And how can how can that environment be how can that environment interact with the story at every phase? That's like a whole nother level. Like right now, I'm just trying to think, how do I get the shots that I need? But much like in video games, when a character can reach over to the environment and pick up something and smash something over the head with it, or they're fighting somebody and they realize, oh, I can just push them over this ledge. Um, being able to work the environment into the story I mean, to me, that's just good storytelling, but it is something that I think experienced storytellers do instinctively, but I think I'm still at the stage where I have to consciously say, oh, wait, I can get more mileage out of this if I try a little bit harder. I think the challenge that I have is that I've lined up a shot where I have stars on one side of the character. And then stars on the other, and then a little bit of the dog right there. Maybe what I'm looking at should actually be a column. We're looking at part of the station from the top. See, the problem with that though is that then the portal I think would be a little bit too far from the side too far from the angle that I want to be visible for this shot. Because the idea here is that if I'm slowly showing someone pushing into the space station, I want to lay out enough of the geography that when I start moving in and moving around and doing closer shots, that something you saw in that first wide shot will give you an indication of where you are in the rest of the shots for the scene. So that in theory, the viewer will not be lost in the visual geography. The viewer will always have a sense of, oh, I'm at this part of the space station. Well, I'm at that part of the space station. Um, it's not necessarily a matter of taking them by the hand. It's more of a matter of having it subliminally be there, and then they never really question it. Let's see here. James is in the chat. How you doing, James? Um, I'm glad Facebook is working again this week. I don't know what happened with that glitch last week. Uh, he says, more space stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I spent a big chunk of the week sort of drawing this story and then redrawing it. And it's more sort of like, I know the story I want to tell. The story I want to tell is very simple. It's just a matter of me picking the shots that I want to use. I kind of knew when I drew the thumbnail up here, this number two thumbnail, I knew when I drew it that the idea of having the dog looking over her shoulder from the building was going to kind of be a tough sell. When I say tough sell, I mean 
doing it in a way that makes sense geographically for the space station, the dog, and the astronaut. see here and I mean part of it is just me being stubborn and wanting to have space on both sides of the uh, the astronauts uh, helmet because if I were to just say okay they are standing in front of a window so here's a window dog inside window astronaut in front Let's see here. <laughs> yeah, James says, okay, I thought they were bumping heads, but that's probably because it's a thumbnail. It says, I can see um, see the dog looking over her shoulder. Well, th this is one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to work out because what it's supposed to be, it still doesn't look like what it's supposed to be. Because right now, it looks like the dog is in some sort of dog spacesuit looking over her shoulder. And what it's actually supposed to be is the dog is a certain distance away from her. And he's looking out a portal. He's inside the space station. She's outside on a spacewalk. And the dog is just trying to get her attention because he's a dog and he wants attention. Hang on. I got to adjust my brightness here. For some reason, it just got weirdly dark. I don't know why. <clears throat> anyway, yeah, so I need to work out both how to make this shot read the way it's supposed to, which is dog looking out a window trying to get attention, and then how to position the space station or reconfigure it so that that shot, so that the space station is in a position where that shot would make sense, where that shot would exist. And there's something that I tell myself when I'm in situations like this, which is just keep walking forward. Because when I'm telling you I'm trying to figure this thing out, I really, considering how long it took me to come up with, uh, with this design for the space station, and it's not the world's like revolutionary space station. It was just something that fit everything I wanted in the story. That took a good long while. So the idea of now tearing it apart for one shot is a little bit terrifying and it's a little bit frustrating, but I feel like this shot sells a lot of what's, it, it just feels right in the moment in that a person is working on a space station and then you see part of the space station behind them and then you see a dog pop up in the window like it does a lot of work storytelling wise in terms of transitioning it seems like a good way to introduce the dog of course i could go back to what i had before which was the exact same thing, just from a different angle. I mean, that might make life easier is if instead of trying to insist on doing this particular story beat, which I really, really like, because I like framing it in the sense that I've got both the characters facing the same direction. And I like introducing a character. Somehow having a character just come over someone's shoulder seems like a good way to introduce them into a shot. But what if instead I go back to something I think is in one of the earlier storyboards? Which is... Same concept but now astronaut facing 
to the left. Working. Then you've got the space station. Behind. And the dog popping up here. Let's see here. James says, yeah, I can see where you're figuring out distance by having the dog's head smaller than the astronauts. I've seen similar things in comics before. Yeah, um, it's one of those things. And, and that's uh, like when I first drew this original uh, storyboard, this one that I've labeled number two here, the story beat, part of it was I made the shot close enough that you could see the dog's expression. Like, even though it's a thumbnail, it's going to have the dog's tongue out. You see that the dog is happy. So it's not one of those things where the dog is like, I'm so sad. You're out there in space and I'm trapped. It's more of, hey, 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 like the way dogs would try to get your attention. Now, if I move, change this shot, the thing about it is it doesn't give me it doesn't give me the warm feels that this shot of the dog leaning over the shoulder does. But what I can do is whatever I end up, there's a part of the space station. I love this now. Now it's like we're actually in space and I'm rotating this. If the end of this pod here, The end of this pod here is where the astronaut is actually doing the repairs. Over here, I can have the dog inside of this uh, this viewing station, anywhere in there. And it, it's like that's kind of the shot. So really the challenge I have now is not, it's not so much the staging per se, it's how to make this new shot that I'm trying to draw have the same feel as the, uh, the, the story beat panel. So the, this story beat panel, the close up of the astronaut, it's got a thing where they're, con they're con concentrating. It looks like their mouth is up and snarling, but it's gonna be their tongue doing the whole unthinking thing, kind of uh, trying to get something done, concentration. I want to angle it so that I can get feeling. That's the thing I'm trying to get now. So I guess the staging doesn't really need to change much. I just need to work out positioning the figures within the frame to feel like one character is concentrating and the other character is trying to play with them. So at least I don't really need to super redesign the space station. If I can work out this shot and get it to, to fit the tone I'm going for, then I will be pleased. And the first thumbnail that I just drew does not accomplish that, so I'm gonna draw another one. Let's see what happens if I change the angle just slightly. So, Astronauts. Three quarters. Let's 
it's probably worked better if it's three quarters with them leaning into the frame as opposed to out of the frame. Hmm. Pardon me. And uh, James says, is that a circle in the middle shot just a placeholder? Um, no, that was me at first when I was talking about redesigning or re moving the pieces around on the space station. That was me trying to figure out like the circle was going to be the sort of the column of the space station. If I were going to move that space station so that the, that main column was now behind the uh, the astronaut directly, and the window was going to be facing them. So this was me starting to move pieces around on the space station. And I'm leaving it there because I don't know for sure as I work out the shot if I'm still not going to need to adjust the overall space station. So this is sort of a, an overhead diagram similar to what I have on... Uh, where is that overhead diagram? similar to this diagram where I was first trying to work out where the astronaut's gonna be versus where the airlock is versus where the windows are. So <clears throat> in working that out, that was basically this diagram is how I designed, came up with the space station design. Like originally I just had some of those kind of like a needle with a bunch of antennas sticking out of it and then big solar panels. And then I kind of refined it by saying, all right, it's gonna need an airlock. Um, there's a little grabbing arm that I attached to this thing. And that's one of those where I didn't put it in there because it gets used in the story. I put it in there because it made sense to me that there would be a floating space arm from other images I've looked at of like the International Space Station, other space station designs. It was one of those things that I put in there because it would be there, not because I actually use it in the scene. Because um, I didn't want to get too out of control. I mean, I definitely, I've got a page full of reference of different space stations that I was looking at while designing this. But I didn't want to go so deep into this that I'm really trying to make it true to every detail that would be in a space station. It just needs to look and feel like a space station. It doesn't need to be accurate to what a space station would have. But if I can see elements there that that would just sell that feel, that's what I would put on. This is a really long answer to what was that circle in the middle, which is just, it was the start of another diagram like this. And I'm leaving it up until I know for sure whether I am gonna have to change anything on this space station, move stuff around for this shot that I want. And to be honest, I probably should go back and look at my story beats again, just to make sure that there isn't another shot that, uh, that would require me changing the way the space station is laid out. Bless you. Khaleesi's kind of keeping me company here. Uh, let's see here. No, I think that that is the only shot that would really require me changing the layout. And I'll tell you another reason why I like this shot is because right now it keeps, even though in, in panel one, the astronaut, she is facing to the left. But when you go to panel two on, no matter which way she is facing, she's on the left side of the screen. The dog, I named him Sagan. Sagan is on the right side of the screen. So it kind of keeps that, that visual, like they're set apart. She's on the left, he's on the right. They're trying to get together. So it's kind of a, 
keeping the visual continuity consistent and now going up and changing this shot I feel like I'm breaking some of that that continuity When I say breaking that continuity, I don't mean it like, oh, I'm intentionally breaking it. I mean, I see that I'm doing something that I don't want to do, and I need to figure out how to fix it. That's what I mean. I mean, this is the hardest part, whether it's animation or comics or filmmaking, is you know working out the story logic so that the, each shot makes sense for the story you're telling. Um, it's also the thing that I enjoy doing the most, but it is, it's hard. Let's see here. <clears throat> James says, I've been going back to drawing hair, mainly long feminine hair. I'm trying to get the split in the middle, less roundness on the ends. So I guess that mainly has to do with looking at reference and getting the shapes right. Um, what well, you know, what's funny is... I've mentioned in the past, I've taken a lot of classes with uh, the, the art instructor, Carl Ganas. And he has a class specifically on heads, hands, and feet. He actually has a really good book that I've been doing studies from called Headshots. And it's all about just drawing the head. But one of the things that I've really taken away from his lessons is uh, drawing the head drawing hair as one big mass. So instead of looking at like, you know, the, the part in the head, I mean, yes, there'll be a part, it's just areas where it curves, but almost looking at it as if it were sculpted in clay as one big shape. And then looking at that shape, like that two dimensional shape and saying, all right, what does that shape look like in three dimensions? I'm not really explaining it well, but I mean, well, that's why he's the instructor that he is, because he can explain it well in a way that I can't. But something that helps me when it comes to looking at hair, and you can even do this if you have like a tennis ball or any type of ball laying around the house. If it's a tennis ball, throw a T-shirt over it. If it's um, like a basketball, throw a towel or a sheet over it and just look at how the fabric drapes down from it. Because unless somebody has a lot of product in their hair and they have it intentionally up and twisted in a lot of different ways, hair kind of falls in the way that drapery falls. It just, there's a point at which it's attached and it drops down from there. And if you think just in terms of gravity, pulling down on a major form, start by getting just the overall, like if the hair, if they've got bangs or whatever, you've got like, here's where the hair separates you have, you have the forehead just think about a sheet of fabric coming down and framing the face and have it come down as far as it goes. If it's going to curl in, then let it curl in at the bottom. And then imagine that going all the way around. If you can get that kind of cone shape, like let's say here's a head. Let me just draw it. Yeah, here's a head. And you've got the part in the front and you've got that hair coming down imagine this shape just wrapping all the way around so If you can get that shape, whatever it is, to feel solid, I'm gonna erase this a little bit because I feel like this should come a little bit more straight down and this should curve in a little bit more. And by the way, um, something that helps with working out 
fabric, um, hair, landscapes, anything that is kind of organic and has a uh, a non-linear, non-blocky feel to it, cross contours really help. And what cross contours are is, you know, a contour line goes along the the outline of the silhouette. So a cross contour is a line that cuts across that, like a wireframe in 3D animation. <clears throat> so you could lightly draw cross contour lines to help you figure out sort of what's happening three-dimensionally, and then either erase those lines later, or if you're drawing digitally, draw them on another layer turn them off and you don't need them. But when you draw something like this, what you can do then is you can look at how the, uh, the overall shape of the hair lays on the head. And then you can come in and say, I'm gonna give them a part. And if you're gonna give them a part off to one side, then you can actually move over to one side and make that part follow the contour of the skull. Or if you, if you decide you're going to have the hair short on one side and long on the other, or maybe pulled back over, over, the, over their ear, you can have that pull cut across these contour lines, but then go up and over and use, continue to think of those contour lines as a guide for how you're going to be putting these shapes. Hang on just a sec. One of my cats is freaking out. I need to see if they're okay. I'm back. I'm back. The cat was just freaking out because there's a rainstorm. Oh, we're in that uh, that LA hurricane warning that's going on. So the rain is freaking her out. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So James says. Uh, says, uh, okay, I kind of see what you're saying, looking at it as one big mass. Yeah, um, when you look at it as one big mass, that's sort of the step one. And then you can go and refine those details, but refine those details respecting the larger mass. You can use that large mass as a tool to help shape and position whatever details you're going to add into it. So yeah. Um, now, what was I saying about story? I don't remember what I was saying about story. But anyway, I'm experimenting with different angles here. Trying to get this shot that I want. And maybe... that. So I've got that little part of the space station off to the side. Kind of cheating the shot a little bit. See here. <clears throat> yeah, James says, "Yeah, I hope the ferals who hang around my house are okay." Yeah, uh, that that rain is really coming down. It's supposed to be uh, pretty horrendous for the next uh, 
12 hours, but you know, I think it's really more of like the Inland Empire and uh, and actually Las Vegas is supposed to be getting a lot of rain, I think. So James says, I will try with the three-quarter view. You know, it's funny. Sometimes it's actually not very different for me drawing a diagram for a space station before I can figure out how to use it in a shot. Sometimes I will draw something from a front angle or a profile just to figure out how it's physically built before drawing it at the angle that I need to. And I mean, we'd all like to believe that we could just do all this work in our heads, but sometimes it's just getting it out on paper helps us realize, oh, wait, I just wasn't looking at it quite right. And that's all you need is just being able to see what it is you're trying to do. And then, and then just from there on the page, you can tweak the angle to the angle that you want. Now, Paul says, uh, I like the hair tips. I need help there. Uh, yeah, I, hair can be really tricky because it is um, – because it's almost like it's fabric growing out of our head. We have bones and muscles that are solid. And yes, our flesh is fleshy, it is, it's soft, and we can twist and turn it, move it. But hair is flowing and dynamic, or it can be puffy, or you can have a lot of product in it and have it at sharp, spiky angles. It's so much more transformative than the rest of the body. Believe it or not, a book that helped me a lot with this was a book on landscapes. Um, I believe it was called Drawing Landscapes and Seascapes by, uh, by Jack Ham. The same guy who did, he's got a famous book on drawing the figure in the head. But I enjoyed that book so much, I got the other two books he has. One on drawing animals and then one on landscapes and seascapes. And he definitely, when drawing landscapes... He gets into trying to think of a way to phrase it. <clears throat> he gets into looking at the landscape at a fundamental, like here's a sheet of earth, and then putting a grid on it and saying, okay, you get to this point, and this goes up, or this goes down, or there's a valley in it, so it, it dips in. But the whole idea of using um, a wireframe like the same way when you're looking at a 3D model, he he describes landscape in terms of using that wireframe to help you describe what's happening volumetrically to the surface. You're not just looking at a landscape as a bunch of flat plains. Here's sky, here's a mountain in front of the sky, here's a grassy field, here's a river. He's trying to show you there is volume and depth in that landscape. And that's not to say that there aren't people who don't do amazing work with very, very flat looking landscapes. There are artists who are amazing at that. But I think that a surprising number of those artists that are able to make things very, very flat feel like it has depth on a subconscious or very active level, like maybe they studied it really, really hard. They've studied that wireframe sense of depth and they understand how to make flat things feel like they have depth. You know, with a combination of saturation of color, lightness, um, composition. So <clears throat> it's not something that, like if somebody has it naturally, that is awesome. But for me, it is something that I have to work at. But I found that that wireframe, uh, that wireframing approach has been indispensable in figuring out how anything is put together. You can use it on landscapes, vehicles, people, what have you? Hang on. It's a flash flood alert. Right by my microphone. <laughs> See here. James says, I like a good landscape shot. Yeah, you know, me too. It's one of landscape is one of those things that I never paid as much attention to because I wasn't interested in it when I was younger. I mean, I think now in life that there's so many things I want to know and don't have enough time to study that I wish I had studied when I was younger. 
All right, so now I'm switching back to another diagram. And this is just me going back to the space station as I currently have it. And trying to figure out if there's a way If I am here and the window is there, where does the camera need to be in order to show the dog in the, the window? So if I have a camera basically right here close to the astronaut, Will that give me the shot that I want? And the answer is kind of. When I say kind of, the reason why, again, I come back to this shot that I really like is that it very clearly describes the situation, which is space person in space, safety. So the dog is in safety, the astronaut is in space. And having that clearly defined, this shot to me tells me everything I need to know about what's currently happening. Changing that shot now, when I'm looking over here, what I'm getting is... Astronaut, space station, and then space. So I can still get the dog looking over the shoulder. And I can still get the astronaut close up. But what I lose is that sense of isolation. And by isolation, I mean Go back up here. That character being surrounded by space and then having safety off to the side. On a subconscious level, that's what that shot communicates to me. <laughs> Paul says, later in life, we start learning all the things we don't know. It can be daunting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that whole expression of uh, youth being wasted on the young, the older you get, the more true it is. And I just realized all of the opportunities I have had to learn in my life and to learn from people who knew their shit and were really experienced and that I just did not take advantage of. Um, I think that's actually the big difference between people who we sometimes see them going on to do be really successful in their field, successful in storytelling, is that they maybe just took advantage of opportunities that other people either took for granted or I took for granted. And and they just they learned when I was off being, eh, I'm just gonna go do this or do that. Like I feel like I would need five or ten lifetimes to do all the things I want to do to learn all the things that I want to learn. I mean, hell, even high school, which most kids generally think high school is kind of a drag. Um, if I had looked at high school through the lens of, there are all these things I'm going to want to know in life, and I just started cramming my head full of them, like started taking figure drawing classes in high school. 
um, you know, got a waiver from my parents so I could go to a junior college and take classes there. Um, learning about business and entrepreneurship made every single project I had to turn in in school for every class somehow relate to what I actually wanted to know or learn. Understanding the connection between art, art history, and history. Because that's something that I really didn't understand. I, even in college, the art history class I took was boring as shit. It was just medieval art. But it wasn't until I was older and listening to podcasts. Like There's a podcast I listen to called Hardcore History. And it's this guy, Dan Carlin. And he just explores a bunch of different topics. Usually they're very long episodes and long series of episodes. Like He'll do like a three-hour, four-hour podcast on um, on like Vikings. And then and he'll do like a five-part series of four-hour podcasts. Like it's like an audio book by the time he's done. A huge audio book. And just hearing him go into depth, it's like the best art teacher you ever had. It's like having J.R.R. Tolkien sit down and just – give you a history lesson. He just sits down and just tells you about things. And there's stuff he'll tell you about the thing you know for sure, stuff that's speculation, stuff that's opinion. He'll tell you, this is my opinion. This is historical fact. These are things that are areas of debate. He'll just, he'll just walk you through it, but just sing down and listen to a guy tell you amazing stories. Um, but the fact that art history was very boring for me when I was in high school and college, and now being older, and understanding how much art history, art history really does tell you where things are now in comparison to where artists, where artists started and why the art world is now, why people use the techniques and processes they need, they use, why different artistic styles have gone in and out of favor um, over time. Like, I mean, I'm listening to an amazing book called The Art Spirit by Robert Henry. And one of the things, he, a couple of times he mentions this guy named um, William Adolf Bouguereau. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Bouguereau, but he is an amazing realist painter. Um, not photorealistic, because a lot of his images are fantasy. But he's kind of like, like if any of you guys are familiar with Brahm, Gerald Brahm, he was kind of like the proto-Brahm in terms of like how amazing he makes fantastical things rendered in a very realistic way. Anyway, he got a lot of criticism in his time for being too academic, even though he's like one of the most amazing artists in the world, but things in terms of artistic movements and history, I didn't see the connection between the history of the actual world and what's happening in society to what's happening in the art world and then what's happening in the art world to the actual art itself and how the art that we consume and that we admire and that we decorate our homes with and the art that we create how all that is influenced by what's come before um and it's weird the older you get the more you start seeing the interconnectedness of everything um and at a certain point all of it's connected and whether you're studying whether you're meditating or you're studying business or you're spending time with your family and your loved ones or you're going through a tragedy or you're volunteering at an organization, you start seeing how – you start seeing all the zeros and ones. You start seeing how the universe and life is interconnected and that – you're like, well, if everything's interconnected, why are people fighting all the time? It's because, I mean, in the same way that like your body, sometimes you know somebody might get liver cancer or they've got GERD get different illnesses. There's times when our body fights with itself, our immune system attacks itself. In that same way, even though we are all interconnected and we should know better, we hurt each other. You know? Um, but I mean, yeah, I'm getting off on a super philosophical rant here, but these are all things that I'm happy with my life, I'm happy with my wife, and I'm happy with, you know, things that I do. But if I had had these understandings when I was younger, I think I would have lived my life completely differently. And I'd like to think that I'd be where I am now, but I'd be fuller. I'd be more me than I am now. Like I could have gone deeper into these things. Um, 
let me copy the the artist. I'm gonna post his. Uh, um, Paul is asking about Bouguereau, and <laughs> he says I like hardcore history too. I'm gonna pull up Bouguereau's um, Wikipedia page. I'm gonna post it in the Discord. Or actually, you know what? I'm gonna pull it up on. Yeah, well, let's see. Because I can post. Because I'm the host, I can post in. Uh, I can post links in the uh, the description, but I don't think anyone else can. So I'm gonna post this in the chat, and I'll also put it up on screen here. All right, here we go. His name is William Adolf Ugaro. I'm gonna post this. <laughs> post this in the Discord, and then I am going, not in the Discord, but I'm gonna post that in the comments. And it says, this five minutes with Jeremy is worth more than 20 years of Sunday school. Well, I, you know what? I I will take that. I'm happy to hear it. Let me uh, pull him up on screen here real quick. So this is the actual name, William Adolf Bougarou. And uh, it's a self-portrait of him right there. So... Um, and I only came into learning about this artist like in the past, I don't know, five, less than 10 years ago, I heard about him, which so the fact that he's been around since, you know, you know, 1870s. Um, but when he, you know, I was able to get a book from a, an exhibition they had of his work, I think, uh, four, four or five years ago. And, uh, does some amazing, amazing pieces. Let me see if I can find the uh, the Dante's uh, Inferno piece. Where is it? There's a great piece that, um, let me see here. Let's paste. Dante and Virgil. Yeah, so this piece was in um, the background of an ad campaign for a succession. And I definitely recommend checking his work out. He's a pretty amazing artist. Um, all right, so we're a little bit past an hour here, and I'm still working out shots. I will probably still be working on this next week, but hopefully I will have made a lot of progress. Um, all right, guys. So with that said, I hope you guys have all had uh, made some creative progress on whatever you're working on. Hopefully you guys have some uh, some thoughts and ideas. And by the way, if anybody ever thinks of like questions later on or like watching this later, and if someone's watching it after the fact and they're like, huh, what about this? What about that? Leave comments, ask questions. I check the comments pretty regularly. I try to answer all these questions. If there's something that you want me to discuss specifically on a live stream, let me know. You can always talk about that stuff too. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I like the community. I don't want to just be a one way me preaching to people. I like us, you know, chop it up, you know, throwing ideas back and forth. I mean, sometimes you guys ask some questions that are really deep and thoughtful that I don't have answers to. And it makes me have to go back and think about what I'm doing, where I'm coming from. And I like that. So that's how we all keep learning and growing. And on that note, speaking of learning and growing, if you'd like to learn and grow with me for 
two extra live streams a month that are uh, both two and a half, three hours long. You can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $2 a month. Head on over to patreon.com slash Jeremy. It's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. There should be descriptions and links for the uh, for the videos. Um, if you're watching on Twitch, there'll be links in the About tab. Um, you also get access to our Patreon-exclusive Discord server where we share artwork, give each other feedback and encouragement, tips. We share process, some um, art tools, and more, kind of an ongoing art discussion throughout the week. Um, you also get access to an online archive of my comic books so you can read them digitally. Head on over to patreon.com slash Jeremy. If you'd like to get a free digital sketchbook, like to get blog posts about what I'm reading, what I'm watching, what's inspiring me creatively. If you'd like to get work in progress and maybe gifts delivered right to your inbox, you can sign up for my free monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comic books, or if you read digitally on uh, Comixology or Kindle, oh, there's no more Comixology, it's just Kindle. I still, a decade of saying Comixology, it's hard for me to undo that. But anyway, go to amazon.jeremy.net. Don't forget to my Amazon author page. You can pick up books like my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. It is a psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. You can pick up my most recent comic book, Morningstar. It is Lucifer's Fall from Heaven, told as a Western. It's an eight-issue series. Volume one contains issues one through four. Volume two contains issues five through eight. Both volumes have extensive back matter, um, character designs, script excerpts, thumbnails, page layouts, photo reference, and more. I basically show you how I put the entire book together. And if you go to the homepage of the channel, of my YouTube channel, you can find book flip throughs of all of those. So you can see what's inside the book before picking it up. Um, and before we go, Paul's got a suggestion. He said, uh, suggestion I had while you were working at your scene what if you flip the dog upside down while it's looking over the shoulder? Zero gravity. Good suggestion. Um, that's something I was playing with in early shots. And I kind of figured I would go back and forth between some places where it's upside down versus not upside down to try and <clears throat> not make the geography too confusing. It is something that is a good suggestion that I do need to come back to. Um, but yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. That is something that I had started to incorporate when I was first thumbnailing, fell away from it. You reminded me to come back to it. Speaking of coming back, come back next week, another live stream. That's it for now. Go be creative.